Welcome to this introductory tutorial for PowerPoint 2010. Over the course of these tutorials, you will learn how the editing screen is laid out, how to create a title slide, bullet list, and chart, how to change the look of your presentation, how to incorporate images and video into your presentation, how to reorder slides in your presentation, and add animated transitions between slides, and how to create and print speaker notes and audience handouts of your slides. When you open PowerPoint, the program brings you to the editing screen. Central to the screen is the slide pane where you will enter the text and other contents of your presentation. Notice the text placeholders where you see click to add title and click to add subtitle. Above the slide pane is what Microsoft calls the ribbon. It contains all of PowerPoint's menu options organized into tabs. The home tab, which is currently displaying, houses text and paragraph formatting options such as apply boldface or align text to the left margin. It also contains the options that permit you to add additional slides to your presentation and to determine what type of slide you are creating, such as a bullet list or title slide. The Insert tab next door contains the options you'll use to insert images, additional text boxes, and video and audio clips, among other things. The File tab on the left presents a more traditional looking menu bar with a list of basic program functions, such as saving, opening, closing, and printing your files. I'll return to the Home tab. To the left of the slide pane is the Slides tab, which displays the slides of your presentation in thumbnail view. This tab is useful for quickly navigating among slides in your presentation. Beneath the slide pane is the Click to Add Notes section. Here, you can enter talking points for your presentation that you might otherwise forget to mention. Enter as much or as little detail as you need. PowerPoint assumes that your first slide will be a title slide. If it is not, simply click on the Layout menu to change your slide type. I won't need to do this, so I'll click again on the Layout menu to close it. To enter text, click inside the text placeholder and begin typing. The placeholder text disappears automatically. PowerPoint's default color and layout schemes are of the no-frills variety, black and gray text on a white background. You can change the look of your presentation at any time during the creation process. Let's do that right now. Click on the Design tab and explore the many templates PowerPoint offers. Slide your mouse over each template to preview it on screen. Click on the down arrow to the right to reveal more choices. If you click on the More button, which is a down arrow with a line above it, you can see the entire gallery, although it does obscure your slide. Click on the template you prefer, remembering that you can change it at any time if you like. You are not required to use any of PowerPoint's templates if they do not suit you. You can change the color of the background and or the text yourself. This is done in an area of PowerPoint called the Slide Master, which acts as a kind of template for your presentation. Here in one stop, you can apply color changes, font changes, and add text or logos that will appear on every slide throughout the presentation. We'll visit the Slide Master later on in the tutorial. 
Notice the Colors menu located next to the Template Gallery. If you click on that, you can choose a different color scheme for your presentation. Simply glide your mouse over the many choices to preview them. I'm going to stick with the default color scheme, so I'll click again on the Colors menu icon to close the menu. I'll save the presentation. The Save button is located under File, but also directly above it on the Quick Access Toolbar. Choose a location for your file, and then assign it a file name. PowerPoint provides a default file name based on the text you entered in your title slide. I'll stick with the default here and press Save. Next, I'll create a bullet list. To make a new slide, you must be in the Home tab. From here, find the New Slide button and click directly on the text New Slide. This displays a list of slide types to choose from. I'll select Title and Content. What you see is a text placeholder designed to accommodate a bullet list. In the middle of the slide, you see dimmed icons that represent other slide content you could select in place of a bullet list. Table, chart, smart art graphics, picture, clip art, or media. I will be creating a bullet list. And as I begin typing, those dimmed icons will automatically disappear. I'll click here where it says click to add title to enter my own title for the slide. Then, I'll click where it says click to add text to start entering my bullet list. Press enter to bring up the next bullet. If you want to create a second level or indented bullet, simply press the tab key before entering text. Pressing Enter takes you to another second level bullet. At any point, if you want to return to first level unindented bullets, simply hold down the Shift key and press Tab. Again, I'm going to press the Tab key to create another second level bullet. Next, I'll show you how to insert a text box. The contents of this bullet list came from a website, so I'll need to provide a citation. To do that, I'll have to create a new text box. Click anywhere outside of the existing text placeholders, then Select the Insert tab and choose Text Box. The mouse pointer now changes to a cursor. Position your mouse where you'd like to start entering the text and click and draw a box on the slide. If the box turns out to be too small or too large, you can resize it at any time. I'll enter my text now and then see what resizing I may need to do. To resize the box, position the pointer over any of the handles, and then click and drag to stretch or shrink the box. To reposition the box, position the mouse pointer on the edge of it without touching a handle so that it changes to a four-sided arrow. Then click and drag the text box to a different part of the screen and let go. I'll resave the presentation. If 
If you've ever seen PowerPoint slideshows in which the bullet list display one bullet at a time, you know that this can be a useful technique to focus the audience's attention on the point the presenter is currently making, preventing them from reading ahead. I'll apply this simple animation technique to the bullet list I've just created. In order to apply the animation to the bullet list, it must be selected so that PowerPoint knows what part of the slide you're animating. If you don't see a selection box surrounding the bullet list, click anywhere inside it to make the selection box appear. You do not have to highlight all the text. Simply clicking anywhere in the bullet list tells PowerPoint what you're animating. Next, click on the Animations tab and you'll see a row of various animation effects. Glide your mouse over each to preview the effect. Clicking on the down arrow to the right gives you access to more animation options. I recommend that you select a subtle effect that doesn't compete with the text for attention. The fade option, for instance. I'll choose that one now. You'll notice that each bullet now displays a number next to it. This number indicates the order in which the bullet will appear. And you'll notice that they all have number one next to them. In this case, it means that all the bullets will appear at the same time. Since we don't want to do this, we'll need to change that. So I'll go up to the Animation pane and click there. And here where you see number one, Content Place, I'll click on the down arrow and select Start on Click. Now if you look back over here, you'll see that each bullet point has its own number. And this means they'll appear one at a time. In Slideshow View, which we'll look at next. I'll resave the presentation at this point. It's now time to see what the presentation looks like in Slideshow View, which is the view you use when presenting to an audience. I'll click on the Slideshow tab and then choose From Beginning. To advance your slideshow, you can click the mouse, press the spacebar, or press the down arrow or right arrow key. I'll use the spacebar. To move backwards in your presentation, just use the backspace key or the left arrow or up arrow key. As you press the spacebar, PowerPoint displays each successive bullet point. After the final bullet on this slide, currently the final slide of the presentation, click again and PowerPoint displays a black screen with the message, End of Slideshow, click to exit. Click anywhere to return to the editing screen or press the spacebar key. The next slide I'll create is a column chart. Under the Home tab, click on New Slide and then again, choose Title and Content. Position your mouse pointer over the Insert Chart icon and click once. The Insert Chart dialog box appears, displaying the types of charts you can choose from. Column Chart is the first option, and that's what this tutorial will demonstrate. So I'll look over the various appearances that the Column Chart can have. The 2D clustered column will be a suitable choice, and it's already selected, so I'll click OK. A split screen now appears with PowerPoint on the left side and Microsoft Excel, which is just opened, on the right. Data for your chart is actually entered and updated in Excel, which is linked to the slide. You'll notice that sample data has already been entered in Excel 
and is displaying in PowerPoint as a column chart. The reason for having sample data on screen is so that you can see where the various elements of your chart are to be laid out. The categories being measured are listed in the first column starting at cell A2, categories 1 through 4. The different groups among which these categories are being measured, series 1, 2, and 3, appear across the first row, beginning at cell B1. Data is entered below. As you enter your own data in place of the sample data, PowerPoint updates the chart that appears next door in PowerPoint. Notice the blue boundary line at the right and bottom edges of the sample data. If you have more columns and or rows in your chart than are filled by the sample data, just continue to type outside the blue boundary lines and they will auto expand to encompass your extra columns or rows. If your chart has fewer columns and or rows than are displayed in the sample data sheet, click in the lower right corner and you'll notice the mouse changes to a double sided arrow. Click and drag the mouse up or to the left to eliminate any extraneous rows or columns. You may only drag in one direction at a time, so if you need to adjust both lines, horizontal and vertical, release the mouse after having dragged it in one direction and then repeat the process in the other direction. I'm going to restore my boundary lines to the way I found them. To replace sample data with your own data, simply click on a cell in your worksheet and type over your own data. The sample data disappears as soon as you begin typing. This chart measures the prevalence of overweight among children and adolescents ages 6 to 19 years. The title will be added in PowerPoint, not in Excel, so I'll wait until I've entered all the chart data and have exited Excel before I add the title. The categories of the sample chart will be replaced in my chart by year ranges. As you enter data in Excel, press Enter to move downward from cell to cell. In this chart, I've entered one more category than appears in the sample chart. Notice how the blue boundary line has automatically expanded to include it. Next, I'll enter my series. This chart compares results between children ages 6 to 11 and children ages 12 to 19. Enter those series using tab or the right arrow key to move horizontally from cell to cell. An extra column of sample data remains that will show up in the PowerPoint chart unless I delete it. I'll place the mouse pointer on the lower right edge of the blue border until it changes to a double-sided arrow and I'll click and drag it to the left. Next, I'll enter the values for this chart using the tab or right arrow key to move across cell by cell and the enter key to move downwards cell by cell. Once I've done this, I can exit Excel. The remaining information and formatting will be done inside of PowerPoint. So when you're done, click in the X in the upper right corner of Excel to exit the program. Note that you will not be prompted to save. PowerPoint displays full screen again. Now I'll enter my chart title. Next, you'll need to define what kind of numbers you're dealing with. In this chart, the numbers entered are percentages, 
so I'll create a label called percent for the vertical axis. First, I'll click once anywhere inside the chart to select it. Notice the boundary box that surrounds it. And now PowerPoint displays some contextual menu options above. Notice the appearance of chart tools above the tabs to the right. This command tab comprises three other tabs, Design, Layout, and Format. It's called contextual because it only appears when a chart is on screen and being modified. To add an axis title, I'll click on the Layout tab under Chart Tool and then select Axis Titles. I want to add a primary vertical axis title, so I'll glide my mouse down to that, and then I'll glide it over to Rotated Title. A rotated text box appears next to the vertical axis. All I have to do is start entering my word in place of the sample axis title text, and it will disappear immediately. So I'll enter percent and then click anywhere outside of that text box and now we have an access title. Next, I'll relocate the legend to inside the chart because in its current location it is taking up valuable space. Moving the legend will add a few inches of width to the chart. I'll return to the labels group right here and click on legend. There's more empty space on the left side of the chart where the percentages are lower, so I'll choose Overlay Legend at left. My chart has automatically resized itself. Unfortunately, however, the legend hasn't chosen the ideal spot to which to relocate, so I'll click on it and position it in a better spot. To do that, I'll place the mouse over the legend border, clicking on it first, until the mouse pointer becomes a four-sided arrow. And then I'll drag it up and to the right and release the mouse. You also have the option on a column chart to display data labels. Again, in the Layout tab, go up to Labels and click on Data Labels. And I like to choose Outside End. The values that you entered now appear above the bars. Should you need to edit the contents of your chart, you can easily relaunch the spreadsheet in Excel. Click on the Design tab under Chart Tools and choose Edit Data. Microsoft Excel opens up once again, and here you can make any changes or corrections necessary your chart will update automatically. Let's change the value in cell C6 from 16 to 20. Press Enter to accept the data, and then I'll close Excel. Notice in PowerPoint, the value has changed on the chart. And although you may not have noticed it, PowerPoint automatically adjusted the highest value listed along the vertical axis to accommodate this new number. PowerPoint will calculate these kinds of things for you automatically. Should you wish to change the chart type, you can do so at any point without losing your data. Under the Design tab again, click on Change Chart Type. The dialog box appears, giving you the various chart types to choose from. I'll click on one of the line chart options and click OK just to see how it looks. This doesn't really suit. It's more of a trend chart, so I'd like to go back. I'll just click Undo, and I have my column chart again. Finally, as the contents of this chart were copied from a government website, attribution must be provided. This will require the insertion of a text box. To add a text box on this slide, click anywhere outside of the chart boundary. 
then select insert and choose text box. Position the mouse where the text will begin and then click and draw a box along the slide. If the box turns out to be too large or too small, you can resize it after you've entered your text. The box now appears with a blinking cursor ready to have text entered. I'm going to enter the source of my chart data right now. And to stretch out my box, I'll click on this handle on the right side then drag the mouse. I'd also like to resize this text. So with the text box highlighted, I'm going to go up to the decrease font icon and click on it several times. And then to relocate, I'm going to position my mouse pointer somewhere on the boundary box and just move it a slight bit. And now I can resize this box to fit the new text size. And we're done.